Is everyone ready for the keynote, the closing keynote of the conference? Yes. No? Yes. 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, so you have Darshi. Thank you. Over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good? How, how, how are you doing? Fantastic. Um, awesome. You guys have any energy left? Yes? No? Yes? You do? You're going to stay awake and listen to me and let me talk for an hour, maybe? 45 minutes to an hour? Um, uh, that's great. Uh, and today was awesome. You guys had a good time? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and now you're going to watch the worst talk ever, <laughs> right? This is going to be the worst one. Um, so my name's Darcy Clark. Um, I'm a developer. Uh, from, I'm going to be talking about the future of video, right? Everybody's interested in that. That's why you're here, hopefully. Um, I'm going to fix this slide. There we go. Um, I'm a developer, designer, uh, speaker. Uh, I'm also a mentor. And I call myself a UX advocate. I gave that title to myself. Um, actually, I gave all these titles to myself, but that one especially. Um, so I advocate for better user experiences on the web. I really care about uh, how something feels, how it functions. Um, I'm from Canada, right? Everybody thinks I'm American. No, I'm from Canada. Yeah? Uh, so that's cool. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Darcy. I have my first name, uh, which is pretty cool, right? I had to pull some strings to get that. So uh, I get a lot of missed tweets as well. Um, I used to do a joke. I, I would show some of the missed tweets, but they're pretty, they're pretty bad. Um, you can also fork any of my projects on, uh, on GitHub if you want, and you can check out my website. It's really old. Don't make fun of it. I'm sorry. I haven't posted any blog posts in a long time. Um, so some work that I've done, I co-founded a company called Themify. Does anybody use WordPress? Yeah, no, some of you? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, if you go to themify.me, um, I co-founded that company. Um, oh, my phone's going off. Turn this up. People are adding me on Twitter. Um, so, and I've worked with a bunch of startups as well in Toronto, uh, and I've done some consulting for the likes of Google, Microsoft, uh, and I've worked with some open source projects um, and contributed uh, to the community. Uh, I helped start a sort of a, a concept called the front-end developer interview questions. Um, that got really popular on uh, GitHub, and it's a great resource to help uh, sort of find the right questions that you should be asking either uh, potential candidates for a job position or basically to test yourself and uh, see if you uh, if you're sort of know what you should know as a front-end developer. So cool. So over the last 12 months, the last year, uh, I've sort of been focused on a number of different areas. Um, if you like any of these subjects and you want to talk to me about um, one of these things today, um, after, after my talk, feel free. Uh, things like build tools, uh, lang language abstractions, uh, responsive images. Um, but the one that we're going to focus on today is uh, video um, and sort of the future of video. <coughs> so I put an asterisk here. Um, the future of video, um, I, I consider it kind of like a, a moving target, um, literally a moving target. Um, kind of funny. A target's like, the Walmart, you know? Um, because I started doing this talk about a, a year ago. Uh, I've done it about two or three times, and it's changed. Uh, over, it's changed over the past 12 months, for sure. And it's because we keep changing what the future is, right? The future is never, never here. So when I say the future of video, that might change in a month or two. And what you might have thought was the future is now the present and the now. Um, so, but hopefully I'm going to show you some stuff that's kind of cool um, and that you'll, you'll enjoy. Um, what we'll cover today is a little bit of history, how we got to where we are, um, the current landscape of uh, building video experiences on the web, and then we're going to talk about the future, and uh, I'll dive into that. Uh, essentially, this breaks down into experiences, codecs, containers, encoders, lots of really cool stuff. If we can get through all this, that'd be amazing. Buffering, uh, digital rights management, and encrypted media extensions. So if any of that makes any sense to you guys, that's awesome. You're already a leg up. 
that means nothing to you. There's going to be some sweet demos, and I'll try to make you all laugh or something throughout the, I'll dance up here if you want. Um, so at least you enjoy your time. Um, awesome. So I want to kind of go back and, and sort of uh, figure out how we got to where we are today. Um, so let's kind of look at the history of um, Codex containers and playback on the web. Um, in 1986, uh, Sony released actually the first digital um, video format. Um, it was called D1. Um, it was uncompressed, so you can imagine that was a very good way of storing uh, video information. And it only stored up to 94 minutes, right? So like that's like one movie. That's, that's it. That's all you could, uh, you could store. Um, in 1988, two years later, uh, Sony worked with a, a team at Ampex to create the next version of D1 called D2, um, kind of like Mighty Ducks. Have you guys seen Mighty Ducks? Yeah? As a Canadian, hockey is my thing, right? Yeah? You have, do you guys play hockey? No? Anybody? Yeah, you play hockey? Field hockey. Oh, yeah. Ice hockey. Yeah, yeah. Ice hockey. Um, so the, the cool things about D2 were it was uh, simultaneous playback, um, which was really cool, a stored composite video over component, um, which kind of meant that you could overlay graphics um, uh, on top of, uh, so imagine if you want to have some sort of news headline, you could put that on top of uh, another piece of video. Um, so that was the composite video. Um, uh, unfortunately, it was still uncompressed, though. Um, and then in that same year, H.261 is released. And uh, you'll recognize that format as it was the first release of the H.26 format family, right? Um, and the big thing here was they actually used compression. Um, which is a first. My phone keeps going off, sorry. Um, so this was, this was the uh, big revolution uh, in video formats was that now there was a video uh, format out there that was using compression um, to optimize how much video you could store, right? Uh, video information you could store. And essentially, every single video format since uh, the H.261 has basically being built off this, this, uh, this format. <coughs> so if you kind of, um, if you haven't ever looked into this, the word Kodak actually comes from uh, coder plus decoder. It's just like two words mashed together. And, uh, or, comp or, well, it's either coder or decoder. It's a compression and decompression. So when people say Kodak, you can imagine you're talking about how do we encode all this video information and how we decode it, right? Like what's the encryption and decryption, right? So in 1994, a few, uh, a few years later, um, a company called the Duck Corporation actually uh, released something called True Motion. Um, it didn't require a separate decoder, which was really cool. Um, so everything was in one format, the encoding and decoding. Uh, it had lo lossy video compression. So um, uh, it meant that you um, essentially, uh, it, uh, it would be like talking about JPEG compression versus ping compression. So ping is a lossless format, and uh, JPEG is a lossy format. Um, so uh, what was really cool about uh, the true motion was it was a lossy format. Um, and it used the AVI file extension, um, which I don't think a lot of people use today. Um, it went on, to the duck creation actually turned into uh, onto and they created, uh, they basically donated their work um, that they had been uh, working on this thing called VP3. Um, and it was like the original version of the B VP series um, was VP3. And eventually went on and they made iterations to that and they eventually got bought by Google uh, onto and created, they created VP9 in the WebM format. Uh, VP9 is actually in uh, WebM and, and VP as well. So that's kind of the history of uh, codecs and, and video formats, or digital codecs and digital video formats. Um, some history as far as video playback goes. Um, in 1991, we had things like this, right? Does anybody, remember, anybody ever see a video like this? Yeah, you have like an old school Mac. Yeah? Yeah, some of you? No? Uh, so this was like how we would uh, basically watch video in a playback uh, format on our computers. Um, in 1995, we, uh, you saw Real One Player. Anybody remember this? Yeah, everybody, yeah, I loved it. Right? It was sweet. What was really cool about Real One Player is they had a web browser in it. 
Yeah? That's a terrible idea. You know, you got a video player up there, you got a web browser. How do you get anything done? There's just so much going on. Um, so this was kind of funny, right? Like, I, I love real one player. Um, then in 1996, we got uh, our favorite, right? This is our favorite, you know, playback. Uh, Flash, you know? Everybody, who loves Flash here, right? Oh, you do? Oh, it's a, being legitimate? Um, so this uh, obviously took off, the Flash player took off, and it was also, then you could embed these players, real one player, you could embed um, the QuickTime uh, player, you could embed into websites, and same with the, the Flash player. And a few years later, uh, in 1997, this was one of my favorite ones, right? Winamp, yeah? You guys, I had this for sure. I was playing Battle.net or StarCraft, and you got some scripts going on. Oh, it was amazing. Um, you could create, like, bots that could interface with Winamp. It was amazing. But I, this is how I remember it. Oh, wait. I took that slide out. I'm going to find that. No, okay. I remember it being the boxy version. You remember the boxy version? I used to have a slide of it. I don't know where it went. Um, but essentially, the aftermath of all these different video uh, players um, and these different video formats was a big fragmentation in the codex, right? So we had um, FLVs, we had AVIs, we had, you know, uh, WMAs, what else is on there? You know, a ton of stuff. Our WMVs and uh, MPEGs. So there was this fragmentation in video formats, right? Who supports what, what will play back in the web? Um, and this is no good. There was also a concern about copyright, like proprietary video formats. That's also not good. Right? Like, we have this fragmentation as far as licensing. Um, that's, not, that's not great for the web. Um, and then we had all these plugins, yeah? You had to install it, right? You had to install the player. Um, so the browser had to have a plugin. Um, so you get all these prompts, and you don't, you know, you just click yes, you don't even read the license. You know, your firstborn child is actually, you know, Adobe owns pretty much all our lives, right? We just click yes. We have no clue what the terms of use are, you know? So in uh, February two, 28th of 2007, um, Opera, right? Who uses Opera? Anybody use Opera as like a browser? Yeah, some people, you're, you're legit. You're the coolest. Um, they, they came up with this spec for the video element, right? HTML5 was, going, uh, was right around the corner, and they came up with the idea that we really need to have a standardized native video implementation in the browser. So Opera proposes the video element, and they actually implemented it the exact same day, which was awesome. So there's, there's a mailing list thread uh, that goes back and shows that they were like, hey, W3C, we want to implement this uh, awesome thing called the video element, and we actually just did it. So we, we, here's our spec, um, and then everybody basically used that to, to implement it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so in 2015, right, we're, that's, that was eight years ago. We now all know about the video element. We all include it in our websites. Um, it's ubiquitous. But we still have these plugins. We still have these proprietary video players, right? Flash is still around. Silverlight is still around. Um, still being used. Netflix, I think, still uses uh, uh, Silverlight. So there's still implementations. Um, and the big reason why is because of all of these guys, right? All these big corporations that hold on to, you know, like old school Hollywood. Um, they hold on to proprietary licenses. They're concerned, right, about DRM. And I, I consider DRM to be defective. It's digital rights management, trying to license and lock down content. It's, uh, it's, not, the, it's not the right way for, uh, for I, us to sort of protect uh, content and intellectual property. I think they do just a terrible, a terrible job. DRM does a terrible job at trying to protect IP. So there's like a cool website if you want to go check out and read more um, about at least the way that I think about uh, copyright and why it's bad. Um, but unfortunately now, these, these companies have come up with a new spec, right? Somehow they got into the w open web standards game. They've been working with W3C. They want to get rid of Flash and Silverlight because they know it's not, you know, they know that it's uh, not being supported um, by Microsoft and Adobe anymore, really. And they know that there's hug bugs um, in, in both of those players. So they want to move away from it. They want to use the open standard of the video element, but with some caveats, right? So the encrypted me extensions is a new uh, spec. Essentially, 
um, that explains how we will encrypt data uh, that's being uh, streamed to uh, a video element um, or any sort of like media that we're streaming from, from a server. Um, and there's a couple specs. Uh, the biggest con contributors to these specs are companies like Netflix, right? They really have an invested interest in getting off of uh, Silverlight, um, Microsoft and Google. Um, and these guys all have uh, want to lock down, um, uh, lock down essentially like IP and sort of please all those big corporations. Uh, so they're the ones driving this. And it's, it's kind of a, if you, see, like, if you look at these three names, these guys all have commercial interest as far as uh, getting involved in uh, open standards, creating uh, standards for the rest of the web. Um, and me personally, I, I think that's bad, bad business practice. Um, because what they, has come along with that is a bunch of bad, um, again, bad business practices in the sense that these standards, in a lot of cases, they're having backdoor meetings. They're not talking with uh, the rest of the web community about how things are being implemented uh, that are going to be shipped in the browser. So it's just no good. Um, <coughs> so yeah, they want to get rid of um, Flash and Silverlight, and they want to replace it with the video element. And it kind of, to me, it kind of, I look at it this way. You know, they, they are getting rid of these plugins, right, the plugin architecture for how they serve uh, video, and they're just replacing it, swapping it with something that's standard. They're kind of using and abusing the standards bodies to come up with a new, new way of uh, getting, getting um, or utilizing the cool stuff that we get to use as uh, people that are a part, or developers that are a part of the open web. So Firefox, Mozilla, the awesome comp company that they were, they were fighting back against these guys with this, uh, the encrypted media extensions spec. Uh, they kind of lost out because Netflix has such a huge uh, market share um, in terms of traffic. You know, they have like 30% of the traffic on the web is, is from streaming from Netflix, which is crazy. It's amazing. So they sort of threw around their weight and they said, you know, this is the way we're going to go. And if uh, Mozilla wanted to keep up, you know, if they wanted to maintain their relevance as a browser, they had to support this. So they, they announced uh, last year that they, you know, they're going to give up the fight and, and stop fighting for open standards, which is kind of sad. Um, but makes makes some sense. So if you're actually looking, uh, if you work for a company that might be interested in getting off Adobe or Silverlight and utilizing the video element and streaming data and encrypting it and making sure you have a way to, to protect your uh, content, uh, you can check out this HO5 Rux uh, uh, EME blog post. Um, and it just goes into uh, details on how you actually uh, create like the key that you, gets passed back and forth from the server and the, and the client and how you actually stream data and encrypt that data. There's also uh, the Shaka player, um, which was released by Google as another option if you want to use a plugin that will help or a, a library that will actually help you uh, do this. Um, but yeah, so that's, a, that's essentially, uh, I think essentially that's it uh, or all I want to talk about. Um, for encrypted me extensions. Um, again, it's not something I'm, I'm super happy about. I don't think that, um, that it does anything. You know, people are still downloading and still pirating software one way or another, um, and getting involved in web standards doesn't help, um, help the rest of the web. So uh, I want to sort of talk about building experiences with video and where, where we are right now and what people are doing with the video element. Um, so we all know how to implement video, I think, or most people do. It's pretty simple. Uh, I can zoom in on this, this guy. Uh, you know, here's like a sweet, whoa, explosions, right? Uh, this is just a basic video tag with like attribute controls. And you know, I've got some fallbacks for different browsers. So I have the widest support possible in different browsers. I've just defined uh, MP4, WebM, and uh, UV. Um, and then I also have a fallback if you don't support it. If you're going back to like IE6 and you don't support the uh, video tag, there's also a fallback with a link, right? So this is how we implement it. You know, uh, to sort of go further from just playing video uh, and we want to manipulate video, what a lot of people do is they actually stream video into uh, like a Canvas object or into WebGL. So let me open up this guy. 
So a pretty simple, uh, simple implementation here is I've got a, a div, and it's inside of it, it's got a video tag. Let me bump this up a little bit more. There we go. Um, it's got a video tag in it, and then it's also got a canvas object sitting right beside it. Um, and what we do is we grab the elements, or the, the basically select the elements that we want, um, get the context, and once the uh, data has loaded, we just start a set interval. This isn't the, this isn't the most optimal usage. I would, if, uh, if you wanted to be streaming data from video, um, I'd usually say use like a request animation frame or something like that instead of set interval. But uh, essentially what this does is once I start playing the video, it will actually draw for each frame, it will start drawing into the canvas and updating the data there. So let's go like this. Probably gonna have to refresh this guy. And see. Yeah. So cool. So you can see I play the video, and on the, the right-hand side, the canvas is sitting there, and it's just being mapped. All the data is just being mapped over uh, into the canvas object, right? So this is the first sort of step into manipulating uh, video on the web, right? So I got a number of cool demos here um, that sort of showcase how you would then go off and change this. So this is Remy Sharp. This is uh, a guy. He wrote H. I think HTML5 um, Essentials or, or something like that, um, or HTML5 Rocks, I think, or HTML5 Demos, HTML5 something. He wrote a book um, with, uh, with a guy from Opera, and so he's got a number of HTML5 demos. Here we're just essentially taking a video and you're changing uh, some of the color data on each frame, so it's just playing right now. Um, we, we can actually use Get User Media, which will take the information from my webcam and stream it into the object. So if I refresh this guy or I change this, yeah, let's do FaceTime. Let's see how bad the Wi-Fi is right now. Is anybody downloading anything right now? Are you guys pirate? After I just said don't pirate things, did you just go download a bunch of stuff? Here we go, okay. Sweet, so here now we've got the get user media spec. Essentially it just streams anything that's coming in from my uh, webcam. Um, it's really simple. Uh, code to use, we scroll down here, uh, we do a loaded uh, metadata, and we're just drawing essentially uh, from the source, we're just drawing from the uh, get user media uh, event, we're just drawing to the canvas, right? So that's kind of cool. So you can do some color manipulation. This is a really fun demo utilizing 3JS and WebGL. And what's actually happening here is, again, we're taking a video that's running, but we're using it as a material um, on these boxes. And uh, it's, I think there's audio as well, but uh, you can see that it's actually playing, playing a video and it's exploding it out um, and giving you this really cool effect. Um, so this is kind of like an interesting concept of what we can be doing with video on the web right now, right? Um, and creating cool, cool experiences. Um, let me see, we got some audio now. If I refresh this, probably gonna chug along if, if I do it. This is another uh, example of essentially utilizing WebGL. Um, I think this is not, this is shaders. They're not using materials in this, in this case. They're um, taking a video, in, uh, drawing it in WebGL, and then we can do some like cool, uh, like, let's do a zoom blur, right? So on the fly, you're watching me manipulate the video um, tile. Oh, yeah. Woo, look at this. Uh, okay, what else can I do? Mosaic? Yeah, get nice and pixelated. So this is a kind of interesting demo of what you can be doing. Again, all we're doing is streaming in video, and then we're man manipulating it on the fly. Um, it's sweet. And then last, this is kind of like a really old demo. Um, I'm not even sure if it loaded properly here. So this is one of the first ever, when, when the video tag came out, there was a lot of people that were super excited because they wanted to start, they thought there'd be sort of a revolution in, in uh, making videos. They thought that um, essentially we were gonna create a whole bunch of free and open source kind of videos. Um, so if I like click around here, I can like explode the video and it like comes back together. It's kind of slow right now. Just because the, there we go. Can we, 
sort of chugging along here. I've got like a million video demos like lined up, so. Sweet. And then one of the kind of things that I love, and I've actually worked with quite a bit, is sort of uh, facial recognition and facial detection um, based on, again, that get user media mixed with uh, video. And so here, I'm gonna try to throw my face in here and start detecting. Let's see if it's gonna chug along. And in this demo, actually, we can choose, again, a face to map using WebGL for mapping like the Terminator. Uh, wait, what's a good one? Like Kim Kardashian? Yeah, is he gonna give me my beautiful lipstick? See, I'm sure that on camera this is gonna look great, me just making faces at my computer. Um, all right, let's try Rihanna. There we go. Yeah, she looks good. So, and this is uh, really interesting, right? Like as an experience, we are taking the, that stream of, of information, we're doing some sort of manipulation on it, and then we're drawing to, um, drawing to a canvas, or uh, yeah, in this case, canvas uh, experience. Um, all through uh, video manipulation. Um, what I'm hoping is gonna load now is actually uh, an experience I built uh, for Lincoln. Uh, everybody knows Lincoln, the car company, um, for the Grammys uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I got together with them and we did like this music selfie uh, sort of uh, project. So here we go. Um, so what it does is, if we can generate one here, so here we go, music selfie, I can use my webcam or I can upload a photo. Um, I'm gonna use my webcam, because again, that sort of shows off how we can be creating cool experiences with video. And again, you can see the, there, facial recognition. See the kind of dots going up and down, right? And we can snap a picture. This is gonna be really weird. Uh, and you can see that we use this thing called CLM Tracker to sort of analyze the image data, pick out the points of your face, um, and what we can do is, from there, do some really cool analysis. And this project actually took those points of your face and created a unique song for you, a unique, really nice sounding song. Um, I'm hoping we can get audio in here. Um, it goes off and hits an API, and we had this algorithm that would actually create a unique song for you based on your face, right? Based on all those points of your face. Um, if it doesn't load, I might just open up the, yeah. Oh, there we go. So as it's playing back, we're sort of like showing you what's, what's being highlighted on the screen. And if I click on, or I sort of highlight these different areas, they actually isolate the channel of the music, right? So you can see that the jawline is the bass, bass guitar, and let me replay that so you guys can see. So let's just highlight the lips. So you can see the lips are actually the totality, and there's none. Cool. And if we highlight something else, my nose, my big nose, percussion, it's cool. So, and they all come together to essentially create this awesome experience, and if you can sort of like highlight different areas around here, do some WebGL. Uh, we do some WebGL sort of filters on top of that, that video. Um, so that's more static, um, a sort of static experience, but mixing with video and, and, uh, and some image data, we get a cool experience, right? Um, so there's a whole bunch of other ones. A lot of people have uploaded pictures of themselves. Uh, yeah, let's, let's open up one more and just listen to what this lady's face sounds like. I hope she doesn't mind. Um, <laughs> she signed off to something, right? She clicked yes on one of those boxes. She's, her face is now all over the internet. Um, if it's gonna load, it's a little slow. But again, uh, we, we had, uh, I think, over four million different um, potential unique uh, songs that could have been created from your, your unique uh, facial attributes, which was uh, really cool. Um, little loader, you gonna, gonna work? It's just going to start playing at some point. Um, okay, well, that's fun. You guys can go play with it. It's called Lincoln the Music Selfie 
project if you want to check it out later. Um, so that's kind of some cool stuff that we can do right now, right? Like we can actually build, you know the tools that you can use to build these ex uh, experiences, things like 3JS, um, you know how to work with video, um, and you know JavaScript, hopefully, or you're, you're starting to learn JavaScript. So yeah, link your music selfie. So I want to talk kind of about, again, what we can do right now with JavaScript and, and video, but also this leads into what I think the future of JavaScript and video and video on the web is. Um, so there's this really cool concept of basically encoding and decoding uh, video with JavaScript, right? JavaScript can do everything, always bet on it. Brendan Ike says always bet on JavaScript, right? He's, I, I think he's right, um, although sometimes he goes off on tangents about WebAssembly or whatever it is that he's into at the moment. Um, so why JavaScript? Why, why do we think it's a good idea to be encoding and decoding um, uh, uh, video with JavaScript. Well, it's not proprietary, right? It's an open standard. JavaScript's open for everybody to contribute to and to have discourse about the future of. Um, it gives us more control then, right? It's not proprietary and we don't, we don't have to worry about licensing um, with JavaScript. Um, it provides sort of an alternative to the backdoor spec, right? The, uh, the media extensions. We can actually do something really cool where we can watermark with JavaScript, we could potentially use Node on the server and be streaming video content uh, to the browser from, from our Node server, and, and we could do some really cool stuff there. Um, and of course, we want to use JavaScript to do this kind of stuff and to build these experiences, these new video experiences going forward because it's awesome, okay? JavaScript's awesome? Yeah? Woo? You still with me? Yes? Are you excited? I'm excited. I'm really excited. Um, so JavaScript video encoders. So this is crazy. If you've ever done anything with video and you know about encoding, right, encoding a video or changing the codec of a video, you'll probably have run into this project, right, FFmpeg. A lot of people have done that. Everybody's used it. Yeah? Well, I'm going to show you that you can actually run FFmpeg in the browser. What? Right? You're all like, no way. No. It's kind of slow, but, uh, you know. Um, so a team worked a couple, like two years ago, worked about, uh, at converting FFmpeg, right? I think it's a C library, convert it to JavaScript. And what they used was mscript in, and they did some, like, uh, they had to do some um, fixes after they ran it through mscript in, and um, it basically came out with JavaScript in the browser, which I think is awesome. And the project's called videoconverter.js. Uh, so they have this nice little fun demo, kind of an ugly website, but you can choose a file, choose, let's say, like MP4, and it's actually reading the, uh, in the browser, completely in the browser, it's reading the uh, video data right now. And once it's done, it gives you some options of things that you would typically do with FFmpeg, right? Like maybe change the format of the video, like we're gonna convert like uh, MP4 to, uh, you know, maybe a GIF or to, M, uh, to a MPEG or movie file. Um, maybe you want to do something like flip or do some crazy thing with uh, uh, some sort of transformation of the image data or the video data, like blur. So let's do like a vertical flip. And I, I hope in your Wi-Fi, and let's export. So we start off with a MP4. Let's uh, convert that to um, a move file. And if you click Start Processing, you can see this is all running right in the browser. You start to see um, uh, the work that's being done. It's just like basically console logging uh, all the information here. And it's processing this. So it's processing it. I can hear my fan. It's running like crazy. This is all happening in the browser. JavaScript is now converting a video, right? Encoding a video and doing some uh, sort of manipulation to that video. Um, all within the browser, um, which is nuts, right? Because, yeah, this is the future, right? You're like, we don't need, like, there's no need for a server, in it, for server anymore or, or an operating system. There's no, uh, okay, click here to download. Oh, it's done, yes, okay, it's way better than I thought. So click here to download my output.move. Let's look, and wicked. So now it's like flipped upside down. I'll show you the, actually, I should have showed you the original one. You have to just, would have to believe me that it was not flipped originally, right? Um, so, here, can I get to my, 
Yeah, I can get to it. So here's the, the original video we started off with. It's a guy in a subway in Toronto. And you can see it's just kind of looping and there's just like a sliding door. So what we actually got back there with is a dot move file, right? We converted a, the video file right in the browser and we flipped all the image data. We just like turned it around. Amazing, right? Amazing. So cool. JavaScript can do anything. Um, cool. So let's make this full screen. Close that guy. So the only problem with video converter JS is encoding right now in the browser, just doing it 100 percent in the browser. It takes a long time to actually load the script, right? Video converter JS is basically like ffmpeg.js. It's pretty much this huge library that has the it's like a, imagine having a script file that was like 10 megabytes big, right? It's like a huge image. It's like almost the size of jQuery, right? <laughs> making fun of you <laughs> and your file size. Um, but it, unfortunately, it's slow and kind of memory intensive. But this is only going to get better, right? It's only going to get better. It's only going to get faster. It's only, uh, the JavaScript uh, uh, VMs are only going to get faster. And it's uh, potentially uh, something that you could use in future projects. But so that, that's encoding, right? But uh, what is probably more viable at this point is decoding with JavaScript. So right now we have, you know, still some fragmentation with um, uh, video formats being supported in every browser, right? A lot of people say that MP4 is probably the best uh, video uh, format to be using because it's most widely supported, right? Um, but there's still some, some edge cases. Uh, and there's also edge cases in terms of experience, right? Um, so mobile Safari takes over the video experience. Um, so that kind of sucks, right? You don't want to have to full screen the video and uh, you know, you want to control what, what experiences are that you're shipping on the web. So utilizing a JavaScript decoder, you can actually read video, uh, video files on the fly and actually um, uh, be pushing information to Canvas, just like we were showing with video experiences. Um, so there's a project out there called JS MPEG. It's pretty cool, right? It's mind-blowing that you can basically read uh, video uh, video files and be uh, real time decoding the frames and pushing them to to uh, to the browser and it's really simple right all you do is you specify the, where the canvas is and you say oh I want to start a new player and I want to read that video dot mpeg right so simple right so cool mind blowing awesome right uh, and then unfortunately though mpeg is kind of a crappy file format not a lot of people use it. Um, it's got, you know, narrow file uh, requirements. It's kind of picky as well, this implementation. Um, so I wouldn't recommend using this. And this actual library doesn't support audio. Well, that's, that's sort of a killer, right? Um, OK, well, there's, there's more, right? There's more of these libraries you may not have even known about, right? Uh, there's a VP8 one. Now, this, this is starting to go somewhere, right? If you want to use WebM, it's got the best compression. It's amazing, right? So. Check this out, right? So it's a little bit, you know, the codes, let me, let me do this. The code, there's a little bit more code here, right? Um, but still, this is not a lot of code for the fact that you are reading video files and, and pushing them to the browser. So you define where the canvas is, define the player, I'm gonna get rid of that, um, and you do an Ajax request to basically get the, uh, the file and then start reading it, right? And then spitting out the data what we do here is we say we spit out the split up the data, um, the chunk into frames, and then we start painting. So let's check this out. Uh, I think I might have to refresh for this guy. There you go. So you can see that same, uh, and like same videos being now uh, read and thrown into a canvas object. Um, and we don't have to worry about support. You don't have to worry about if the browser supports WebM, right? It's just JavaScript and the canvas object. Beautiful. You guys excited? Yes, okay. Unfortunately, right? Unfortunately, uh, performance isn't very good on mobile for this, for this specific uh, uh, implementation. And performance on desktop wasn't as very good still. And, and unfortunately, there was no audio. That's a killer, right? So okay, so this, this is maybe the way we go. There was this project called Broadway JS. Has anybody heard about this? 
Mozilla put some put some time uh, to this, um, and it's. Let me open it up, and I'm really hoping it's going to work for me here. I might have to refresh this page as well. So it actually does MP4s, right? So it will read an MP4, and again read the video file and start painting frames to, to canvas object or utili utilize WebGL. Um, and I'm hoping, come on, I clicked you. This demo is a little bit slow. But essentially, uh, it, uh, it does give you, it does give you support for MP4. Um, it's got similar problems that it doesn't support audio again, right? So that's, uh, that's a killer. Right. So I come to you now with probably the last decoder that, that I want to show you, and it's the OGV.js. And again, you've probably never seen any of these projects. Um, a lot of them are kind of experimental. But this is probably the best one I've ever seen. Um, and I'll show you why. It's got audio. It uses the Web Audio API. Hola. It's Mi got es amazing, like, like basically, Seguro it's got amazing API usas. to actually interact Pero with all this stuff. This is essentially just a canvas object, right? That's it's just reading the file uh, information, the video file information, and painting through canvas, which is really sweet. Again, you don't have to be worrying about the browser support anymore. Got some information here. Right. So th this is a great demo. This is a great library that I, 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 you know, if you think that you need to be working around any browser limitations, proprietary licensing limitations, or anything like that, um, I would suggest looking into the, this guy. Um, so this kind of leads us down a path. We start thinking, okay, we don't need to care. Oh yeah, go. Flash video for compression. So the thing is that WebM, for for instance, is probably got the best compression. Right? Um, we you don't care about compression um, because all you're doing is like doing like an AJAX request to get the the fi file information. So if you are trying to load, uh, let's say a hundred to five hundred megabyte, um, uh, and that's like pretty big uh, video, it's going to take as long as uh, to go get that video as it would to go request uh, JSON or XML from an API that is also 100 to 500 megabytes. So y your compression limits are, all, are only limited to the file format compression limits that you are um, storing the video data as. Um, what this works around is a proprietary uh, uh, licensing and, and formats um, for the browser implementations, right? You're working around that because you don't care what the browser actually supports, right? Sorry? Yeah, we're gonna get into that, man. You know, give me some time. I'm gonna, I'll get there. I get there. We're talking about the future. It's, there's a lot here. I'm, uh, I'm trying to cram it all in. And yes, the short answer is yes. We'll get there. Um, so we're we're essentially we're le leading ourselves down this way where we're like. We don't care what you know uh, browsers implement anymore, right? Let's have just a pure JavaScript codec, right? Imagine we encode and decode, uh, you know, um, information with just JavaScript. And there was this promise, uh, or this this blog post that was actually made um, about two years ago by Brendan Ike, who was working with a company called Otoy at the time, and he said, "I have seen the future," right? He was like, "I've seen the future of the web," um, and it's this. Um, cool service called Orbix JS and Oitoy is this company that's going to build this product that uh, lets us basically have a JavaScript video codec, which is amazing, right? Um, and he said it's next generation, and uh, you know we're going to be able to utilize the cloud and all the GPUs in the cloud, so you have like amazing performance. Basically, you could run AutoCAD in the cloud, and you would, could run it on a Chromebook or a very netbook, right? You could have a really um, poorly performing hardware that can utilize um, cloud computing to, to do some really cool stuff, right? So you could be running Photoshop in the cloud and be interacting with it. And all you were doing was just streaming the information back and forth with 
Um, so that was kind of cool. And the, the promise was this, uh, this library called Over Orbix JS. And it has 25% better compression uh, than H.264. Um, and then it has, has a number of other amazing features that, like, you know, this sounds amazing. Um, that was two years ago, right? And last year, I started, well, about a year and a half ago, I started doing this talk, and Orbix.js has still not launched. So I feel, I, I feel like I have to have some mean words with uh, Mr. Brendan Ike. He actually sits on the advisory board of this, uh, of this company. So um, I, I, you could call it vaporware. It will probably never come out. Um, and it's okay, we've got other solutions. But this was sort of the, the revolutionary uh, concept that everybody was talking about at the time. Hey, let's, hey, let's come up with a, a JavaScript um, uh, video codec. So if you've heard sort of in the news lately, um, again, Brendan's like, I've got this new idea. There's something cool that we can do on the web. Um, it's called WebAssembly, right? WebAssembly, um, short form is WASM, sort of takes the best of ASM.js, if anybody's used that, and WebAssembly. Um, and it's going to utilize, you know, bytecode, and it's going to execute faster than JavaScript. Um, they say it won't compete with JavaScript because everybody's going to still want to write JavaScript, and th this will just be for highly performing um, uh, apps like games or, or, you know, if you're trying to write software that's going to run in the browser, you would probably uh, compile it into WASM. Um, so this is uh, the potential for us to create a JavaScript-only video codec is there uh, utilizing uh, WebAssembly um, in the future. And I, can, uh, I bet you'll hear a lot more about it um, in, in sort of the months and, and the year or years to come. So, so that's sort of it uh, as far as like a JavaScript video codec. Um, but going back to actually encoding and decoding um, and utilizing the video element, right, using the video element and um, canvas uh, objects or canvas element in the, uh, in the DOM. Um, you can actually do streaming buffering utilizing this spec called the media source extensions, right? Has anybody heard of this? Anybody used it yet? No? Awesome. Uh, so I have a couple, uh, again, uh, Mozilla wrote a really good, um, one of the guys at Mozilla wrote a really good uh, blog post uh, called Streaming Media On Demand with Media Source Extensions. Um, there's a lot of good information there uh, as far as how you implement these things. Um, but I'll just run a demo here. So it, it's really simple to set up. The Media Source API is, is as simple as saying, uh, new media source, and I'll sort of get down on here. Right. How do you do the option? Yeah, okay. One sec. Let me zoom back out. Yeah, there we go. Woo. Awesome. So uh, it, that's the API media source. Um, again, we specify the video that we want to be um, sending uh, information, video information to. Um, and then you listen for the source to open, and then we start basically uh, passing, like, uh, we pass along a, uh, a source buffer, and we tell it what uh, codec is being passed along from our server. Um, and this is how you can actually stream uh, video. Let me refresh this guy. So I think it auto plays um, once it's actually done. Okay. How bad? Oh. Click refresh. Okay. There we go. So you can see that uh, it, it essentially buffers from the server, does some chunking. Um, so you, it's basically streaming from from a, from uh, the server, which is really cool. So you can imagine that if anybody knows like Twitch TV or any other uh, sort of streaming sites, um, that they're going to eventually move off of their Flash and Silverlight. Uh, implementations and, and start utilizing, or even YouTube, right? YouTube Live will start to utilize um, the media source uh, extension to create uh, purely uh, non-proprietary, uh, non-plugin um, experiences uh, for streaming, right? Um, so okay, I think I have another example of this as well. Oh, yeah. Um, so, I actually reached out when I saw this blog post, this is a couple weeks ago, I, I reached out um, to the guy who wrote it because uh, I wanted to highlight that um, Vine, does anybody know what Vine is? 
Yeah? How many people? Yeah, some people know. Um, you know, taking short little clips, short little video clips. Um, you know, Instagram has also has that support. But that's sort of their business model is to um, sort of share short little video clips. I know a guy at Vine who told me that they were utilizing, you know, the, uh, the media source um, uh, API, um, which is currently only supported in uh, Chrome. Um, I think Mozilla has uh, potentially, I think, an implementation now um, or support now. It might be behind, might be behind a flag. But they're essentially doing um, some buffering, right? They actually load um, uh, videos ahead of time. So you can imagine when you try to preload images, right? Um, you want to go out and fetch, um, you know, the next image that might be in a carousel or some sort of photo gallery. You'll want to sort of expect that the user is going to go back or forwards in that carousel. Um, and so you'll want to preload those things. So what Vine does is they utilize a single video. In this experience specifically, they reuse the same video element. And what they do is they create buffers, video buffers, um, for the videos that are going to be uh, potentially loaded before or after. Um, and they queue them up and start loading them. And they just basically pass that information right into uh, the, the video. So there's almost a seamless uh, experience um, now, unfortunately, the, the Wi-Fi is not that great, so I think it's, it's taking a long time for them to actually queue up the, the video information. Um, let me see if I refresh. But essentially, they, they want to create this experience where you're seeing a little clip, and then it goes to the next little clip, then the next little clip, kind of like a automatic, automatically rotating photo gallery, right? Um, but in this case, it's automatically rotating video gallery, right? It's kind of really cool. Take off the, I'll unmute the sound. Maybe the OBS. Come on, Wi-Fi. Who's using Dropbox right now? Get off of it. Get off of it. Somebody's playing video games back there. I know it. They're like this guy. He's Canadian. He hasn't said A once. A? Yeah, Canadian A? Do you guys know? We say that all the time. A? No? No A? OK, well, this is taking forever to load. Um, but essentially, like I said, they use, Vine is one of the first uh, people to actually implement this new API to um, really get some performance enhancements over their video experience, right? So they are, are buffering uh, videos before they actually come in, um, which is really cool. So if you were, does everyone know Back to the Future? This is my favorite slide I've ever created. It's the best. Um, there's a little box shadow there, or text shadow. It's amazing. Um, so if you walk away from this, uh, from this like, talk today um, thinking about anything, being inspired or going, wanting to go out and learn uh, more about you know, these concepts, um, I hope that you sort of walk away and you ask yourself, OK, what is the future of video? What did Darcy tell me? You know, what should I be uh, interested in? Um, well, this is, these are the sort of the five things that I think about when I think about the future and what's going to happen in the next 6 to 12 months. In, in the open source world and in, in, uh, in JavaScript. Um, you're going to see more and more creative, immersive experiences. People are going to do more and more with, with video on the web, utilizing JavaScript. Um, you're going to see the encrypted me extensions. You're gonna, if you work with a big company, they'll probably, and they have video content that they want to lock down and secure, you're going to probably have to worry about that and, and learn more about um, encrypted me extensions. Uh, media source extensions, so the buffering, the streaming, um, if you work with a company that does any streaming video or you want to do live streaming, you'll probably work with that. Um, WebAssembly potentially has uh, uh, impact on your life if you, uh, again, are working with uh, any kind of like big applications that want to, uh, like, or our game development studios that want to ship uh, experiences to um, the browser. And then potentially a JavaScript video codec, a pure JavaScript video codec, um, which might be uh, around around the bend. Um, so thank you very much for letting me talk and run around on stage here for the last little bit. Um, does anybody have any questions? No? I got, I got one more thing, really. I could show you one more thing. I, does everybody know Oprah? Yeah? No? Some people know Oprah, yeah? Yeah, I've got one more thing. Or Steve Jobs, one more thing? Yeah. Of course, I wasn't going to leave you stranded here. Uh, 
So, DVD.js, right? You guys got some DVDs? Yeah, I got a couple DVDs for sure. Um, yeah, I love DVDs. Um, so a guy at Mozilla, again, Mozilla is very progressive when it comes to trying to work around proprietary software. You know, they make um, all these cool libraries to essentially um, do things that uh, sort of divert from you know the corporate commercialized aspects of the web. Um, so DVD.js is essentially a library that converts uh, DVD uh, files into, um, into web-ready files. So this is what it does. DVD.js does this. It does IFO files, uh, and they, those IFO files you know, that are on the DVD disk actually get parsed to JSON, um, and it does some other conversion. Um, uh, he basically created this because he had this huge library that he wanted to somehow of his, the huge library of DVDs that he wanted to store digitally somehow. He wanted to uh, watch them when he was abroad, right? So he wanted to be able to um, watch all his DVDs when he was somewhere else. So he basically figured out how to parse out all the information in DVD and turn it into web, you know, web language, things that uh, you know, could be read, like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, utilize web technologies to, to watch his DVDs. So, you know, uh, things like obviously the menu in a DVD, how, uh, you know, the DVD menu, how does that get parsed? Um, so he did all this work, um, and there's a big converter that you can, it's like a one-step process that you can actually convert your DVDs into, like, basically a package of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which is awesome. And I'm going to show you, if the internet lets me, actually a side-by-side -side, um, version of him playing the actual DVD with, VLC, um, and then it's running in a web browser. Essentially the exact same information. So, so here it is. He's clicking around on some menus. You know, he's showing you that he's basically converted the entire chapters and menus of a, of a DVD to just you know, buttons and HTML and CSS. And then he's going to click play. He's going to start playing the video, or he's going to skip to chapters. and. Uh, yeah, cool. And then he's gonna, I think, at some point, play the video. Come on, where is it? There we go. Oh no, he's going to credits. Okay, cool. There's the credits. Yeah, play. Come on. There we go. So he starts playing it, and so he's uh, basically showing you that you know uh, he did, doesn't have to use any proprietary sort of DVD playback um, software. He can just make everything in the web. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? Does this, isn't, does this inspire you to go make some video kind of experiences on the web? So wicked, right? So awesome. I have no clue what the heck they're going to recommend, so get out of here. Uh, um, so thank you, guys. Thank you so much for listening to me, and we'll, we'll talk later. Uh, do you want to come up? I think Nourish has some, uh, some final words. Oh, yeah. If, if, does anybody have any questions about this kind of stuff? Or you want to just hang out afterwards and you can ask me in person. That does uh, VP8 transcoding? Yeah. Uh, and RTMP encoder, like. De decoding, yeah, yeah. With, with audio as well. Yeah, so um, I, I tried to make a pull request to that project, actually, because I also thought that um, it, it would be best to use the WebM format and, and having, utilizing VP8. Um, and it stayed open for like two or three months, and the guy never, I tried emailing the guy that like created the project, um, and he never got back to me, like multiple times. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't think it's hopeful that he'll add support for audio, um, unfortunately. And that was probably the best uh, JavaScript decoder that I, I've seen. Um, so that's the best project, and unfortunately it doesn't support audio, so I don't think that's necessarily a viable option. Um, so. Okay, and then the second question is that uh, uh, Chrome had announced some, in fact, many months back that they would have H2X, H.264 support in their WebRTC thingy. And it's not around yet, so any anything like when I, is that going to be supported? I know some people there that I could bug for you, but I don't I don't know any uh, anything as far as this is weird seeing myself. 
Uh, <laughs> weird. Um, I, yeah, I can't say anything about when they'll actually uh, support that. Um, I think uh, uh, I'd have to talk to, but if you want to ping Paul Irish on, on uh, Twitter, he, he knows the right people to, to, to talk to. Cool. Cool? All right. Awesome. Anybody else? Question? Yes, no? There's a, sorry? Native client, to write uh, uh, native client. Native client? Yeah, NACL they call it, right? So can that be used for decoding and coding? Because this takes a lot of time, right? Just writing the JavaScript encoder, decoder. Uh, Has anyone I mean, you could detect it? support. Yeah, you could detect support for WebM and then use that, right? So that's an option, too. You can use something like uh, Modernizer has um, feature uh, detection uh, tests that you can use. So you can just pull those out of Modernizer if you want, and then use those as sort of an if-else. So if there's support for WebM, just implement the video tag and, and point it. Um, and if there isn't support, then instead of falling back with uh, you know, um, other video files that you would have to create, right? you have to be creating those, all you do is fall back to the reading the WebM and then painting to, to canvas. Right, so you use the JavaScript decoding method. Um, so that's that's an option as well, yeah. Um, to, to do sort of feature detection, if there's support, then we'll just use the native native support. So yeah. has someone played around with that? Like video converter dot JS is totally uh, JS, right? Uh, for for encoding though. Yeah. Uh, for encoding, um, that's still uh, I would say that's uh, highly sort of. Experimental, okay. um, so I don't know how often they're actually keeping up with the work that FFmpeg's done, doing, um, because it's, it's sort of it was a port of FFmpeg to to JavaScript. Yeah. So. Any other questions? No. Awesome. Thanks again, guys.